Oh, thank you very much. And I will do more. Okay. Some of this has been demoted. This is going to be my clicker. That's all right. Don't worry. I'm a <laughs> Um, I don't really think I'm any more justified to do the talk on Eunice than a lot of other people here in the room, um, because many of us will have lots of memories. I was just very lucky that in her final day she didn't live all that far away from me, so I was able to go and see her. Um, and I also think most of us will know going back so long when there's been arguments about TV that we all used to sigh whenever we had Eunice standing up because we knew it was going to be at least 10 minutes before she would stop and it would be incredibly difficult to stop her at that as well. So amazing lady and one that I was very lucky as I say to share um, car journeys with although she didn't stop talking from the time she got in the car to the time she came back and we always had to go the Foss way, we were never allowed to go the motorway, we wanted to go the Foss way because she literally knew that entirely. Um, this is a talk that actually was Eunice's talk that I just happened to find and I just thought it would be really lovely to just show you. I don't know what a lot of the pictures are about, um, so I'm just really going to spin through them. This is Eunice in the caravan that she um, was living at before she went into the nursing home. Prior to that she was in a caravan at Castle Kerry. And in both places she had a very good population of rats. She was very fond of her rats. Um, she was born in West Yorkshire and had a really tough life up there, to be quite honest. Her father was a manager of a mill, and he married um, a girl from the factory floor, which wasn't done in those days. And I think if you go on to the next picture, we eventually, I think you'll find actually, some of you may recognise, did we go past it? We actually had Colonel Firth. But anyway, this is the house where she used to live. And in the evenings, um, her father used to go through to talk to the parents, but the mother was left behind because she didn't have the education to be able to speak to the parents. So she read an awful lot to Eunice, and a lot of her learning came from the books that she read with her mother. And this just shows you the water that she used to have to go and get outside the house. It wasn't in the house. And uh, that's almost the type of life that she's been used to all over the years. Right, go on to the next one. Let's see what we get here. So yeah, I think this is possibly taking you just to different places. It was lovely to take her up there. I took her up several times to meet her cousins. And Eunice is the one in front. And behind there is um, her cousin, um, oh, I can't remember her name now, but her two cousins are the two older ones behind. And they married into circus people. And they had this tiger, which was uh, they had from the cub. He used to walk around um, all the time and was obviously in the circus. And Eunice, in her very matter-of-fact way, sort of talked about how much um, they loved the tiger, how she used to rest her head on the tiger when it was sleeping, and how eventually, because of um, popular demand, the tiger had to be then sent to a zoo because they didn't think it was safe to keep it for the circus, and she believed that the tiger died quite soon afterwards of a broken heart. This is her Firth, which is very near to where her parents lived. And up above are her parents, um, she was very fond of her parents, but her father always wanted a boy. He didn't want a girl. And that was always made very plain to Eunice all the way through her life, sadly. And one of the barns that she showed me where she used to play, um, she told me that her mother one time made her a Robin Hood outfit. She had a waistcoat and some shorts and a Robin Hood hat. And she said she felt really, really super going out and playing in the barns. And when she came home at lunchtime and her father saw her, she had to take the shorts off and they were burnt and she was put back into a dress. So uh, very tough parents, I'm afraid, at the time. And this is just the, the town of Holmfirth. And while she was in the house, because she didn't used to have many toys, she used to go down and look through the keyhole in the cellar. And down there she used to see the rats. And that's where she started her love of rats. I don't think we all possibly shared it when we went into the caravan and saw them running around the cupboards. And, and her garden where she was living last actually looked like a huge badger set. And there were so many holes and cars, but they weren't badgers. It was rats. Go on to the next one. So this is her actually in the countryside. She, she loved almost everything. She, was a, she qualified as a biology teacher and uh, she was into all sorts of, of things, anything to do with nature, and she was just so, so knowledgeable. Go on, go on to the next one. And this is her when she was um, a youngster. I would imagine that will be Girl Guides. That's her on the front, on the left-hand side. And in a minute, you'll see some of the booklets that um, they were shown at Guides. Um, it shows you footprints. And uh, I think she was involved with some of it. But the next one, if we put it up, is really quite interesting. It's throwing my glasses. So go on to the next one. 
Yeah. Right. Now, who can read that? Yeah. So, life history. Earth pigs, two to four earth pigs, six recorded at birth in spring or summer. It says that young are produced only once in three years. Gestation usually four to six months, but very variable instances being recorded at birth in captivity after 12 or 15, even 15 months. Cubs are born a silver grey colour, blind till the 10th day, which isn't point, and helpless, later turn brownish yellow, and lastly like adults. Cubs do not come out for months, and mother tends young most carefully cleansing them. So, you know, this was the sort of thing that she was taught about badgers when she was young. And obviously she learnt an awful lot more when she started looking after badgers herself. Okay, go on to the next one. During the war, she was actually one of the fire wardens at Exeter Cathedral. And uh, she was known for having thrown off at least six incendiaries from the roof. Um, she used to keep guard up on the top there. She had a little withy stick that when they did come, she used to just flip them off onto the ground. And when she finished, she put the withy stick in underneath the roof. And many, many years later, she went back to Exeter Cathedral and went on one of the walks around the cathedral. And they went up and she was allowed to go onto the roof. And she was able to get her withy stick that she had used during the war, take it out and take it home. And that was in the caravan with her right up until the end. So the next one just shows you the photos of the damage that was done um, during the war. Okay. So she was the first curator at the Peter Scott's um, Wildfell Centre um, and was very interested in, and I think you'll find that if you go to the next one it possibly is something that Peter Scott actually said about the conditions that she was working in. Um, those of you who possibly are old enough to remember, she was very much involved with Peter Scott and, um, oh dear, who is it, Justin, oh I have the name then, the actor. But one of the things that, that, um, that Eunice used to say, which tells you that things don't change irrespective of many years ago and now, she, she never really knew which partner was with which partner because they kept changing all the time. She's quite hard to follow all she said there, so it doesn't seem to have changed very much even right from those days. But we'll go on to the next one. Now that's the, the next one actually tells you, this is the, the conditions that Peter Scott said um, that user of Eunice Overend was when she went there. She camped in an empty cottage, covered up on a wooden settee until she borrowed a bed. A single tap in the yard served everyone's needs, but the yard in the winter became a quagmire so deep that Eunice, after washing her Labrador blondel mm -hmm. under the tap, had to carry him over her shoulder to the cottage, otherwise he would have become encased in the mud from nose to tail. Rayburn in the cottage provided the only heating, paraffin lamps, the lighting, and there was no bathroom or inside lavatory. And I have to say that her caravan at the end was very similar. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll go on to the next one. So these are just pictures and recordings, I'm sure. I think this is Morris Tibbles, for anyone who remembers her doing filming with Morris Tibbles. And this obviously shows you on the, uh, on the barges by the uh, River Severn where she's working. So she was the first curator and very, very knowledgeable about the birds. Okay. And I don't know, but I'm almost sure that the two little girls that you can see in the picture is Jemima Parry Jones and her sister, because she was very close to the father and to Jemima, and I think that's probably who that is, but obviously you recognise the shell ducks on the right-hand side. Okay. And Eunice was great at art. She really, really, really was. These were some of the pictures that she actually drew. Can you go to the next one? Um, fantastic artwork and actually she made models as well she was really very good at sculpturing in fact if other people hadn't come after her so quickly and it became a production line I'm sure she would have been very well known for her work keep going there you go now a lot of it was scraper board that was what she did especially when she started doing her badges she used a scraper board this is Eunice she started off really with foxes um, and I think you'll find the next one is her scraper board of a fox. Um, always very good with her pictures and did so many over the years. The next one I think tells you the story of the fact that she had um, a fox living in a caravan with her at one time. And at this time she always had um, collies. She, she loved her dogs. I, was, it, I went through all her collies until the last one finally died. And even when I was visiting, visiting her in the nursing home, she was always saying to me, I want my collie dog, I want a puppy, I don't want that anyone that has spot, I want it from puppy so that I can train it from then. And we just were still looking for you, Eunice. <laughs> Bless her. Still looking every time, every time I went to see her. But the fox was living with her and unfortunately she caught um, flu quite, quite badly. 
And one day the fox, unfortunately, I think the next one shows us, managed to get up on the roof. And Eunice, despite having flu, got a coat on and went up on top of the roof to get the fox down. Well, this is typical <coughs> Eunice, it would just cope with any situation whatsoever. Well, and she loved her foxes, and then of course when she started with her badgers, she loved her badgers too. I don't know what that is. Is it a possum? I was asking someone, is it a possum? I've got no idea why it's in the talk, but I think it's a possum. But it just shows you the hardship of where she used to live. Okay, Dominic. And obviously she was knowledgeable on, on all sorts, whether it was, um, it was archaeology. She also rang bells. She rang bells on New Year's Eve from the time when she was in her 20s right up until she was 80. She only missed about two or three times. She did it every year. And this actually gives you an idea of just what a clever lady she was. I'll just give you a couple of minutes to read it because it was quite amazing when the vicar was actually talking about her and saying about just how many qualifications she had. One of the best stories that he said, which I thought was really lovely, was that he said he could remember um, being with Eunice when they did some filming at uh, Stonebridge. And it was in the days when filming was, you know, was, was not as easy as it is now. Great big thick cables they had to spread out to be able to take the footage. And it was very wet, it was in the winter, and it was muddy. And they were actually trying to film muddy ducks. And the vicar said, I can remember the poor chap trying to get this wire back onto the drum. And she said, under his breath, he said, ruddy ducks, the only thing they should be is in a ruddy oven. Which I thought was very good. <laughs> but then you start with Eunice and her badgers. And um, what she actually did was she used to buy badger cubs from baiters. They used to advertise them in the, um, what's it, something in art um, magazine. Yeah. And uh, she used to buy them, and then she used to rear them, and she used to let them go. And from them, she learned so much about them. Just flip through some of the pictures. So there you've got a feeding one. Here you've got a super picture of scent marking. I mean, that cub's only probably about three to four weeks old. Go on next to another one. And brain. So, you know, it's just funny that these are all the things that she used to do. And she taught me so much over the years. She was an amazing lady. And she always believed in her collies keeping the badgers under control. And she also used to keep um, a rounders bat, which she used <laughs> if the badgers didn't behave themselves. And she really did use to have to because they could be quite, um, quite strong-willed when they wanted to do something. And this picture here, I think this is a girl in a school because I've actually had someone come up to me when I did a talk to say, we used to have a biology teacher who used to come into school and she used to have a badger that used to follow her around the school. And I said, her name wasn't Eunice Overend by any way. She said, that's right, she was our biology teacher. So I think this is a school child actually being shown how to bottle feed a badger cook in school. Can you imagine that happening now? I mean, that would just be absolutely horrendous, wouldn't it? Go on. So now you've got just lots of pictures that she used to take of them coming in. Um, she had wiring put all the way around her caravan so that she could keep them in while they were young. Um, it shows you a lovely one of having a bath and one coming through. I think the next picture um, actually shows one. Somebody was asking about a photograph with their fur up like this. Basically just, you know, I'm either scared or I'm excited. It can be one way or the other. But the whole idea of putting the fur up obviously is to make themselves look stronger and bigger. And I think you'll find that's the collie nose that's probably playing with it in the field. And she's always had a trapdoor so that they could come in and go out at their, at their own whenever they wanted to. And in fact, Adrian isn't here with us tonight, but Adrian was with us once walking back with Eunice to our rooms at a Badger conference. And uh, Adrian said to, to Eunice, I suspect you'd be quite glad, Eunice, to have a night's sleep without having a Badger coming in and sharing the bed with you. And she said, well, yes, yeah. she said, it's a bit annoying, especially when they come in at night and you get that horrible wet feeling. And he said, well, what do they do then? He said, do they sort of put their wet noses on you? So she said, no, they come in, they scent mark me. <laughs> Very dedicated. <laughs> right, so the next picture. <laughs> and she learnt about the fighting that went on. She would release one ball, uh, one ball one year, and then the next year she found that if she tried to let another ball go, it would get beaten up by the one that was still in the territories. So she learnt all about territories and things, which really at that time really wasn't known by a lot of people. Go on, turn over to the next ones. And this just shows you, obviously, she was um, a great um, 
person as far as fighting for badges. And when they started to do gassing and different things, they really didn't understand about social groups or the fact that they have their own territories, which is why so many things went really, really wrong. This is her with her, her, one of her colleagues, obviously, me again with a badger. Go on over. This one I love because this was something that we learned when we did our first badger enclosure with wire at, uh, not at 90 degrees, but at 45 degrees. And if you do one more, I think you'll find that the badger is literally climbing over the top of the uh, overlap, coming down and doing it on a nightly basis, which indeed our cubs were. So the very next enclosure we had to do was 90 degrees so that they couldn't get out, and we had to change our other one with an electric fence to keep them in. So people that say the badgers can't climb, really don't know what they're talking about. So this is just difficult stances, the preening obviously that would go on, you know, caravan when they came in. Um, this is one of her boars, I expect she knew every single one by their name and by their sight. She was really an amazing lady. And who can guess who that is? Yeah, I think so, I'm always sure right. it is. Chris Cheeseman. Right. I think you'll find that's Chris Cheeseman at Woodchester Park because if you go on the next picture, I think you'll find we'll show you the picture of Woodchester Park. And she did work quite a lot with them when they were doing all their experiments there as well. I think that's actually him again. I must take these pictures and send them over. I think it is, isn't it? And what's interesting if you look at the next pictures is that they were actually catching them with nets and with um, graspers. They weren't using cages. That's the way that they were catching them to start with, and then obviously they did go on and start using cages once they began to realize that that was the way that they could catch them. And in all of this, Eunice was involved the whole way through to try and encourage people to do things the right way. That shows you a pretty heavy um, radio trucking collar, and also the fact that they used to put um, tags in their ears, but soon found out that through fighting, those tags didn't stay in very long. And then I think it's Chris again doing radio tracking and obviously all the different ways that they worked out the different um, different territories that belonged to different um, social groups. <coughs> Lovely marks of, of paths going out, how they used to do bait marking with uh, the bottom picture they're showing you a dung pit with all the plastic bits in it. And if you go to the next one, again, it's all the work that she used to do um, and it just shows you all the works that up on the top. And she just was... Well, even up to the end, she was a very, very strong person. In fact, I can remember my husband, we went out for lunch once, and she went through some steps, and uh, he put his arm out to help her. Why couldn't she slap him back? <laughs> Don't need any help. That's it. So I'll do that again, Eunice. And this obviously then goes to the gassing, which sadly, obviously, she did a great deal to try and stop together with Janet Rutcliffe. They all worked very, very hard to stop this. And uh, it's amazing just how long it went on for um, before they eventually found out just how cool gassing was. I think they were gassing at 12, 12, they needed 12 times the amount of gas that they were putting down the sets. It wasn't until they did an experiment um, at Portlandville that they found out that they actually needed a concentration of 12 times the amount of gas that they had been using. And this was by the time they'd already gassed between eight to 10,000 badgers across the country. So, you know, the typical things that you would expect from anyone doing a talk on badges, fair caught in barbed wire, show where they're going through the log. Something that doesn't really look like a typical set, but in actual fact is. And obviously showing where they get drinking places and different beds during the summer as well. And the mud balls, I don't know whether people still find those, but we often wonder why they have these mud balls, whether they actually drop from their fur or whether it's something that they play with. Yeah, um, we're not really sure. I know my badger, Bluebell, managed to find a dead duck, and that was in bed with them. We had to get that out before the visitors came. <laughs> Drag that back to the set. Um, so as I say, these are all typical photographs that you would expect to see for someone doing a talk on badgers. And she really was, she was just like Chris Ferris. She went out, spent a lot of time at night to be with her badgers, and learned so much, and passed so much on to so many people over the years. She was a, a really amazing lady. Mating. Who's got photos of mating? <coughs> Not many of us, is it? So if you stop at that one, I think, because that one shows obviously the badgers in uh, in her caravan with the dogs. And she left her caravan in, I think it was about seven years ago. 
And she did still come and visit us if it were because she loved her badges and she would always come and see the badges while she did driving, but she eventually stopped driving. So how long was it before Eunice um, saw a badger before she died? Well, actually, only 18 months because I took one to her at the nursing home and she cried. So it's farewell to a super lady. She really was amazing. She taught me an awful lot and I think she taught lots of other people as well, such a lot about badges. And I'm sure those of us that had the pleasure of knowing her and being shared and sharing in her knowledge won't forget her. She was a very special lady. We'll just go to the last one. Thank you very much.